uh, as you know, we, the Academy very recently published a report uh, on synthetic biology, and that followed uh, 18 months' worth of work led by Professor Richard Kitney, who's going to be speaking, us, speaking to us this morning. And during the, uh, the process of that uh, inquiry, it became evident that there were some significant social uh, and ethical considerations which needed to be a fundamental part uh, of the work. So as such, we then uh, commissioned uh, a public dialogue study in tandem with the latter stages of the inquiry. And it's that that we're here uh, to discuss today. So today we're going to hear from Dick Kitney, uh, who comes from Imperial College London, and he's going to give us an introduction into synthetic biology and to some of its applications. Uh, we're also going to hear from Dr. Jane Calvert of the University of Edinburgh, who was part of the inquiry's working group, and she's going to give the sociologist's perspective. And the findings of the public dialogue study are going to be presented by Suzanne King, who is co-director of People, Science and Policy, uh, who the Academy commissioned uh, to carry out this research. And then we'll have a panel discussion, Professor Robin Gill of the University of Kent, uh, who's here to, uh, to be the expert on theological and philosophical uh, issues. Uh, Fiona Fox from the, the Science Media Center, Synthetic Biology and the Media, we'll be hearing from her. And Professor Paul Fremont uh, of Imperial College, who was a member of the inquiry's working group and the scientist who took part in the public dialogue study. Uh, his special subject is the value of public dialogue from a scientist's uh, perspective. Well, I'm delighted that uh, today we have uh, Professor Lord Winston, Robert Winston, who is going to uh, chair today's uh, session. Well, we all, all know Robert Winston. He's Professor of Science and Society and Emeritus Professor of Fertility Studies uh, at Imperial College. Uh, he's a member of the House of Lords. He's a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences uh, and of particular importance, he is an honorary fellow of the Royal Academy uh, of Engineering. Uh, and of course, he's well known for his uh, television and work and his writing. Um, and his own research area is in exploring innovative ways of introducing new genes into cells and particularly stem cells. Um, he is quoted as saying that scientific knowledge has huge promise, but its possible misuse means that it is important that society has adequate control of what is done in its name. And that, of course, is what we're here for today to discuss. So without further ado, if I could hand over to our chair for today, uh, Lord Winston. Thank you very much, Philip. I, I, um, I won't go on at length at all, um, and I'm not even sure that I can set the scene, partly because, of course, here we have a, a technology which we don't yet understand, we don't know what it's for, and we don't know where it's going, and that really, of course, is really interesting. And what is different, I think, about this meeting is that really, almost for the first time, I think, um, people involved with science and engineering, and congratulations to the Royal Academy for doing this, have really gone out in front to look at the issues with which we should be engaged, both as scientists and members of the public, really in advance. Um, it's a very tricky process, I think, because if you have a technology which is relatively vague, which of course synthetic biology still is at the moment, uh, it is very difficult to pinpoint either specific areas of danger or specific areas, of course, of advantage. And I think that's of uh, importance to us. But I suppose, really, we're reminded of the problem that we had with a number of other biological technologies, uh, the classic one, of course, being genetically modified crops and the way that was handled really rather poorly in the past, partly uh, the notion of a commercial imperative, partly the notion of something which wasn't of any particular use to members of the public and might actually be foisted on them when it had uh, questions of its safety. And I think that really what we're doing now um, as um, scientists and engineers is to respond much more alertly and much more sensitively to those sorts of problems. And so I congratulate the, the Academy for putting uh, this on for its report and for actually conducting the dialogue process. And it's interesting, I suppose, that it's quite likely later this year 
um, somebody like Craig Venter possibly might actually announce the establishment of a new living organism. He's already produced his um, mycoplasma, of course, which is the combination of 25 chunks of DNA perfectly assembled inside a, a yeast cell. Um, but it doesn't replicate, it doesn't move, it doesn't function, it doesn't feed, it doesn't produce energy, so it's not actually doing anything. But at some point, presumably, that's going to change. It's early times. Um, so I think really, um, having said that, uh, I will really just simply introduce the speakers, um, recognizing that uh, during the day, we will be still looking fairly tentatively at some of the applications of this very interesting area of science. Our first speaker is my colleague Richard Kitney. Uh, he's Professor of Biomedical uh, uh, Systems Engineering at um, Imperial College London, and he's co-director of the, the EPSRC Centre, which is established at Imperial College. I should point out, in, as, a, as a member of the EPSRC myself, that the Research Council is keenly interested in this area and is particularly concerned with the areas of public engagement. So we will be following this meeting and the response to this report with, with great interest. And Dick was the chair of the committee of inquiry which set up the, um, the, the inquiry into synthetic biology, which uh, I hope you've all got copies of in front of you. So Richard, over to you. Uh, well, thank you, Robert. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning, and uh, this is really the culmination of, uh, as uh, Philip said, probably 18 months' work. Uh, we are, of course, in the uh, Royal Academy of Engineering, and I am a fellow of the Royal Academy, hence the reason why this is an engineer's perspective uh, on synthetic biology. <clears throat> so I want to start off, because I believe this is a general audience, with um, talking very generally about what is synthetic biology. Um, so this term was um, first coined, as you can see here, in 1978 by um, uh, uh, Lavkor uh, Slabowski uh, in uh, a paper in Jean. Um, and there, as you can see, he first introduced the, uh, the name synthetic biology. Now we, uh, within the academy, actually, in our, in our inquiry, have um, used a particular definition of synthetic biology, and, and this is it. So we define synthetic biology as uh, something that aims to design and engineer biologically based parts, devices and systems that do not exist in the natural world as well as redesigning existing natural biological systems. So that's our definition that we use uh, in, the, in the inquiry. I'll explain uh, what all this means as we go along. So my task uh, this morning is really to give you an overview of um, synthetic biology and uh, I and my colleagues, uh, including Paul of course, who is the, co the other co-director of the Synthetic Biology Centre at Imperial, uh, really see this uh, field as breaking down essentially into four uh, different areas, uh, each of which I will go through in turn starting with um, bottom up. So bottom up first. And I'm just going to pull out a few examples here. So the first example is actually taken from Craig Venter. So uh, uh, the chairman has already mentioned Craig Venter. This is Craig Venter. And of course, you can see that he is a somewhat controversial figure. Uh, but again, as the uh, chairman just mentioned, uh, one of the things that Craig Venter has done fairly recently with his colleagues, uh, you know, people like John Glass at the Venter Institute, uh, is to take this uh, M. genitalium, which um, uh, comprises um, 583 uh, base pairs of genetic material and to uh, basically uh, analyze the, this uh, genitalium. So in other words, the term we would use is its sequence. So this is just a section of the DNA. So what he did and his colleagues did was to identify uh, these individual uh, base pairs. That's what we call the sequence of, uh, of the DNA. Um, and then uh, using um, a number of companies, and here are the three companies that uh, worked on this in terms of the sequencing. Uh, he then reconstructed this, as the chairman said, into an overall uh, uh, representation of the, of the uh, uh, genitalium. So this, if you like, is uh, synthesized uh, DNA. The second area uh, of uh, synthetic biology is what we would call uh, metabolic engineering. And uh, one uh, really quite key example of this 
Uh, and I, I would suggest one area where synthetic biology is really likely to have a major <coughs> impact is in the whole area of malaria. Um, it's been known actually officially for some time, since 1972, although um, you know, it goes back to ancient times, that um, the annual wormwood plant uh, actually has properties to, um, uh, to cure malaria. And so uh, this is scientifically called artemisinin, <laughs> And uh, one of our colleagues, actually, in uh, Berkeley, uh, Jay Keesling, uh, worked on uh, the development of a synthetic version of this drug, of, the, of this anti-malarial drug. Uh, and uh, this has been really quite successful. And now they're using synthetic biology techniques. Uh, he has actually been able to engineer a uh, synthetic biology-based uh, version of this drug. Um, and as a result of that, uh, created a company called Amaris, and uh, Amaris, of course, is based in California. Uh, it's actually, the whole work on malaria is funded by the Gates Foundation, which is uh, really quite interesting. And uh, very soon now, this uh, particular drug will um, uh, be used, uh, I would imagine, throughout the world, throughout the developing world, to, uh, uh, to deal with malaria. Another example of uh, the use of uh, metabolic engineering is in the whole area of biofuels. And again, uh, using these techniques, um, it is uh, predicted that by 2013, which is not very far away actually, uh, there will be significant, significant amounts of uh, much more advanced <coughs> biofuels uh, available coming onto the market. And uh, this is uh, really quite significant in relation to um, you know, energy needs in the future. One of the other aspects of this I should mention is that, of course, uh, as you're probably aware, in Brazil, uh, they have been deriving um, ethanol from sugarcane for quite a long time, but that's a very inefficient process and uses an enormous amount of the uh, an enormous amount of the biomass involved in that. In the sugarcane is actually thrown away, and these more advanced uh, techniques allow you to really reduce uh, the amount of um, loss in terms of biomass, which means you free up a lot more agricultural land uh, for um, the purposes of growing food. The third area here, um, in terms of this quick overview, uh, is what uh, we in the field will call chassis. And these are, uh, for those biologists in the audience, uh, essentially different types of cells as shown here. So these are naturally occurring uh, cells. And uh, so what you do in synthetic biology is to uh, introduce uh, modified uh, bacterial DNA, if we uh, consider E. coli, for example, which is a, a typical uh, chassis that we would use, you introduce the modified bacterial in, uh, DNA into uh, the E. coli, and uh, that, that represents uh, the environment in which the, uh, uh, the response occurs, and also it is the source of, um, of the energy needed. And you can see there are a range of different types of natural chassis uh, which are used uh, in this field. But in addition, um, a number of scientists around the world are trying to develop what, is called, what are called minimal cells. And uh, so here's an example actually from Anthony Foster, <coughs> Foster and George Church, uh, where they uh, have been working, George Church uh, works at Harvard, they've been trying to develop a minimal cell as they call it, which is simplifying a bacterial cell down to its um, constituent parts that are required essentially for the purposes of synthetic biology. Now the fourth area, and this is particularly important actually in relation to the Royal Academy of Engineering, and the, the, uh, actually the approach that uh, is um, uh, pretty much our mainstream activity within the EPSERC Centre at Imperial, is to take an engineering approach to synthetic biology and to uh, break the whole process down into parts, devices and systems, which is the classic uh, way of approaching engineering problems. So I want to spend a bit of time on that. Uh, this is a slightly technical slide, but it's designed to show that um, you know, one starts off at the moment with bacterial DNA typically. Uh, you modify this to create uh, parts. Those standard parts then go into standard devices, and the standard devices uh, go into standard systems. And this slide just shows you know, how that's done. So you know, for those people in the audience who are familiar with this, so this is a, obviously an operational amplifier and a logic gate. And it, this example here is to create on the basis of these standard devices, in this case an oscillator. So a lot of the engineering concepts that one uses in other fields are now beginning to be applied uh, in synthetic biology. 
And all of this revolves around systematic design. So it's the application of engineering principles and theory uh, to the uh, development of parts, devices, and systems. And um, I've just taken an example of a BMW car just to show that this is a kind of universal approach uh, in terms of many, many engineering applications. So um, we have extraction, uh, decoupling, and standardization. All of these are key areas in terms of um, uh, the way in which uh, we design uh, devices and systems like um, uh, BMW car. So an engi engineering systems, to summarize that, are built from standard parts, standard devices, and standard systems. Now the key point in engineering is that each, at each level, the characteristics of the part, the device, and then the system are extremely well defined, extremely accurately defined, and therefore, uh, if we want to produce any of these parts, devices, or systems, they are entirely reproducible, and this is the aim uh, within synthetic biology as well. As I've already said, um, if we want to look at how this translates into biology, then the parts are the modified bacterial DNA. The devices are a collection of these parts, uh, and we encode these uh, into various kinds of functions. So, for example, within my laboratory, we're now producing biologically based logic gates. Why are we doing that? Because uh, these devices, like computers, are all based on these logic gates, counters, calculators, uh, microprocessors, <coughs> etc. So you can see that conceptually here, the development of biological equivalents to engineering devices is extremely important. And uh, as I say down here, once you've uh, developed these, uh, these devices, then you can build them into counters, for example, uh, you know, counting cells, etc. And the other key point here in terms of engineering practice is the, what we call the engineering cycle as represented here. And I've just taken an Airbus as a particular example here just to make the point that this is a kind of universal approach in engineering. So you start off with specifications, you then do the design. Nowadays, you typically do an enormous amount of modeling and this is, this is, this is of course computer-based mathematical modeling. And we absolutely do this within synthetic biology. You then implement the system, then you test it and validate it, and then if necessary, you go around this cycle again, and then eventually uh, the whole process is certified. And this is the approach that uh, we are using in synthetic biology. Now, one of the key elements of this, I've already <coughs> pointed out on one of the slides, is um, standards. And standards go back a long way, so I just wanted to use this as an example. So this is from uh, Sir Joseph Whitworth, uh, 1841 who developed the first standard thread actually for a bolt and of course uh, almost nothing in the world would, in the modern world would work without the standards for bolts and nuts and so you know standards are central to engineering design and they're central to the way in which we approach uh, synthetic biology and so as with many other areas of, uh, uh, of uh, engineering we now define this is a it's called a biobrick, but it's a standard biological part. We now define a uh, really detailed specification sheet. So this is just one example of a number of specification sheets for this particular device so that other people, when they use it, they know exactly how the device, uh, how the part works. How do we implement it? Well, uh, there are typically a number of companies now around the world. Uh, Gene Art in, in uh, Germany, about 70 miles north of Munich, uh, a one that w or a company that we use a lot, uh, we send we send off the uh, uh, the modified uh, version of the uh, DNA. That that's in terms of um, alphanumeric data. You send that off typically uh, using an email. Uh, they then um, synthesize the part that you want. Whoops, the part that you want, and uh, it's returned uh, literally in the post typically. And these are just um, some of the companies. So the Febit and um, uh, Gene Art are, um, are uh, European companies and uh, Gene Maker and uh, Codon Devices are a couple of examples of American uh, companies. <coughs> now finally, just to uh, finish this uh, very quick overview, one of the reasons why we're really interested in this uh, area in terms of the Royal Academy of Engineering is that uh, um, 
people on the working party uh, and indeed the wider community within the Royal Academy believe that synthetic biology could, could well lead to a new industrial revolution. And I just want to spend a couple of slides just explaining why that might be. And one way in which you can do this, and it's a good parallel, uh, is to use the example of uh, the development of synthetic chemistry in the 19th century. There are actually very close parallels between synthetic chemistry and the way that synthetic biology is developing. So just to give you a couple of examples there, uh, which are, of course are, all, are very well known to everybody in the room here, uh, starting off with uh, the uh, synthesis of aspirin uh, by Felix Hoffman in the Bayer Company, as you can see here in 1897. Uh, so aspirin, of course, is uh, you know, very central to uh, our lives these days. So that's one example. Another example is synthetic rubber, uh, the development of uh, tyres using synthetic chemistry techniques. Uh, you just simply could not produce uh, you know, the sort of tyres that we use nowadays, for example, if you didn't use the synthetic techniques. Natural rubber just would not work. And so um, when you read the report, you'll see that um, uh, we quote a series of examples. We actually give a 5, 10, and 25-year perspective on what might be available. Uh, but in terms of the parts, devices, and systems approach, uh, biofuels, which I've talked about, is, is one area which is, uh, we believe is very important. Biomaterials of various kinds, so you know, things like artificial cartilage, etc. New types of medicines, drugs, and vaccines. Uh, and then being able to you know, detect disease within the body via biosensors. So they're just a couple of examples, or four examples. And as I've said, all of this is contained within the report which we produced. And what I've tried to do there is to just give you a quick overview about what are the, some of the key points in terms of the engineering approach to this uh, report and indeed to the field. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we've got a little bit of a, a step for the shorter members of the uh, panel today. Um, so I'm a social scientist and I'm interested in looking at science and technology in their political, economic, historical and social context. And I actually gave one of the talks at the public engagement event in um, March. And um, there I was asked to summarise some of the main issues that had arisen in the media, media and in reports in respect to synthetic biology. So I talked about these issues, biosafety, biosecurity, intellectual property, and what happens when you try to create living organisms from scratch. But today I'm not going to talk about these issues. I've been given a bit of a freer reign. So I'm going to talk about some other things which I'm particularly interested in in respect to synthetic biology. And I just want to start with a bit of a kind of warning, which is that synthetic biology is a very new and emerging field. And if we're talking about new fields, we're talking about the future, and we're speculating about something that hasn't happened yet. And this uh, is the case whether we're talking about utopian visions, about synthetic biology being perhaps the next industrial revolution, or dystopian visions about it being extreme genetic engineering. Both of these are based on speculation about the future. But this doesn't mean it's idle speculation because sociologists have shown that talk about the future does have real effects in the present. It can, it can influence uh, what happens. And synthetic biologists have to talk about the applications of their field because they have to show the potential of the field. But simultaneously, this talk of applications is likely to lead to unease and concern. So there's a kind of double-edged sword here. My second kind of preliminary comment I want to make is that, as Dick very nicely showed, many different activities go on under the heading of synthetic biology. And there are real, lots of competing definitions of the field and some border disputes with some quite um, interesting discussions about who is and who isn't doing synthetic biology properly, which I find really interesting as a social scientist. But they do give rise to some tensions. And it's some of these tensions that I'm going to explore briefly today between biology and engineering and between complexity and simplicity. And then I'm just going to make a few comments about evolution and nature in respect to these tensions. 
So my first tension between biology and engineering. And synthetic biology is a very interdisciplinary field. It brings together computer scientists, chemists, uh, even social scientists, ethicists, lawyers, uh, and biologists and engineers. But the biologists and engineers are the, the kind of interesting tension I'm going to explore here. And this is a quotation from an engineer. He says, a scientist discovers that which exists. An engineer creates that which never was. So I think here we have a nice distinction. Biologists want to understand the world better, whereas engineers want to construct and create new things in the world. And this leads to um, the kind of motto of synthetic biology, which Dick didn't actually come up with, but lots of synthetic biologists talk about. It's a quote from Richard Feynman, uh, the physicist, and it was found on the top left-hand corner of his blackboard when he died in 1988. And it's this quotation, what I cannot create I do not understand. And what's really interesting about this quotation is it links this desire for understanding the natural world we find in bio biology with the desire to create and construct new things that we find in engineering. And it kind of brings them together and it says that the, if you create new things, you will then be able to understand them better. So, but going on to some of the kind of tensions between biology and engineering, um, it's very interesting that in the engineering approach to synthetic biology, there's kind of an idea that you can create biological parts which are modular, standardized, as Dick showed, which are reusable, which are a bit like Lego bricks. And these Lego bricks is not my analogy. This is an analogy that's explicitly used by a particular school of synthetic biology. There's also lots of discussion of plug and play, that you can take a synthetic biological part and you can plug it in to a different biological system. And as Dick talked about, there's a, a discussion of standardization. And these screws here have um, a standardized thread, which means that they can be used in many different applications. And the aspiration is that synthetic biology will be similarly transportable from one application to another because it will be standardized. We also hear a great deal of um, analogies drawn from engineering, both from mechanical engineering, and Dick has already talked about chassis, and uh, this is a really interesting analogy, um, this kind of idea of a cell into which you implant your biological parts and devices. But we also have lots of analogies from electronic engineering, um, discussions of how DNA, protein, and RNA are a bit like resistors, transistors, and capacitors. And one of the questions that interests me as a social scientist is how will these analogies affect the biological systems that are ultimately produced? And also there, are, there is tension and disagreement within the field. Um, some synthetic biologists think that we're seeing an overly simplistic projection of electronic engineering concepts into supposedly biological counterparts. So moving on to my second tension between complexity and simplicity. And this is a quotation from a synthetic biologist, Tom Knight, and again, this biology versus engineering uh, <coughs> distinction. A biologist is delighted with complexity. The engineer's response is, how can I get rid of this? How can I streamline my synthetic biological invention and eliminate the detritus that has accumulated over evolutionary time? And, uh, but can we really eliminate the messiness of biology? And what makes the biological substrate different from the substrates that we usually engineer? Synthetic biologists are having to struggle with this themselves in their own work. And this is another synthetic biologist, Pam Silver, who says, the organism is a long series of kludges, not necessarily a well-oiled machine. And if we um, take this seriously, we might start to question pictures like this, which are drawn to kind of represent the organism as if it was a well-oiled machine. If we just understood it better, we would see it um, as a kind of machine. But obviously the idea that an organism is a well-oiled machine isn't new at all. This is the digesting duck from 1739. And so we've seen these uh, kinds of discussions going on over many centuries. But when we actually come to study the real duck, well, we find that we actually need broader and different engineering principles. So finally, just saying some things about evolution and nature. And this is just a picture of the young Charles Darwin, who we don't normally see. We normally see the old one. So there's, again, a differences in approaches between different synthetic biologists. Some of them really want to make use of evolution and help it work for them. And they will use evolutionary mechanisms in, in the lab. Directed evolution is very common here. 
Um, they some of them say that evolution is the best designer that we have, and they may even describe themselves as evolutionary engineers. So they're basically taking what evolution does and utilizing it for their purpose to create their synthetic biological products. But other synthetic biologists have different views on evolution, and this is a slide from Durendi, a synthetic biologist now at Stanford, and he says evolution is tyranny, it's mutation without representation, and he's hoping that what synthetic biology will be able to do is liberate um, biologists from the constraints of direct descent and replication with error. The thing is that things that evolve are things that change, and things that change are not reliable and predictable and standardized as the aspiration is that synthetic biological creations will be. <coughs> and the tagline of this school of synthetic biology is making life better one part at a time. And here, better means easier to engineer. So in this context, as the designer Anthony Dunn has noticed, biology becomes a product of design choices rather than a product of evolutionary pressures. And these design choices could include industrial and political imperatives. They could even include things like designing safety in, as we discussed earlier, or even including aesthetic concerns in your synthetic biological products. And this means that synthetic biologists will say that because they have more control over the whole thing, synthetic biology is actually about making evolution safer, more efficient, and predictable. But I think it does raise some questions. If something can't evolve or if something hasn't evolved, should we consider it to be living at all? And more broadly, how might synthetic biology come to influence our understanding of the natural world and our place within the natural world? Of course, what natural is, is an incredibly problematic concept. It depends on, on the history and the circumstance. And what we understand as natural um, here in Britain is obviously the result of millions of years of human intervention. But will we come to see the creations of synthetic biology as part of the natural world? And what will these creations look like? I don't know, uh, they may not be distinguishable from things we have at the moment, but I'm just drawing on the kind of analogy of Lego here with these Lego organisms. But there is a danger, again, of starting to speculate about the future, getting carried away and starting to get into the realm of science fiction, which I don't want to do. Um, and I think it's necessary to point out that synthetic biology is very far from creating synthetic organisms. Maybe it never um, will aspire to do this. At the moment, work on synthetic biology, as Dick showed, is at the level of um, bacteria and yeast, primarily um, simple organisms. And some synthetic biology is even cell-free, which means taking the biological components out of the cell and putting them in a test tube and just using them there. So that would obviously raise very different issues. So we need to keep the reality of what's going on in the science in mind, I think. And have we seen all this before? We've already had a discussion of synthetic chemistry, and this is the chemist Frederick Bowler, who was notable because he first synthesized an organic chemical from purely inorganic components. And this chemical was urea. And when he synthesized it, it sent shockwaves through the scientific community at the time because they thought that there was something special and irreducible about living things that couldn't be reduced to merely <coughs> organic components, inorganic components. But will synthetic biology um, become as familiar as synthetic chemistry is today? We have lots of products of synthetic chemistry um, on the market, as we, we discussed earlier. And will synthetic biology, through its novel mechanism of construction, actually allow us to truly understand biological systems to such an extent that we might even be able to write an equation for living things where this step, then a miracle occurs, would no longer have to be part of the equation. So that's me. Right. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, right. As far as we know, um, and I'm sure this audience will be able to update us if this is wrong, this is the first exploration of public attitudes, public perspectives on synthetic biology that's actually been carried out in the UK. Um, but I do want to stress that it's quite a, small, a relatively small study and I think we see the findings very much as introductory and exploratory. So what I'm going to talk about today is just to give you a brief overview of the project, 
run through some of the key findings and some conclusions and highlight some areas I think where our further research would be very enlightening and very interesting. So the objectives um, were to look at public awareness, perspectives, uh, perceptions, attitudes, to explore hopes, expectations and concerns regarding the technology and to um, identify issues for further research. And I think we've achieved all of that well, within the remit of this study. So the methodology was twofold. The first part was an exploratory public dialogue activity. 16 members of the public recruited by a market research company came along to two evening meetings here in this building. Each meeting lasted three hours. At the first meeting, we began by some explorations of people's uninformed awareness and understanding of synthetic biology. Then there were the two presentations you've heard referred to, one from uh, Paul Fremont focusing on the science and one from Jane and she um, told you a little bit about what she spoke about. And then we had a bit of time to explore initial reactions and perceptions and Paul and Dick sat in on those discussions and were able to answer further questions that came up. Then at the second meeting, we didn't have any experts present, although Paul attended the very end of the session, but this was a time for the participants to discuss amongst themselves. And we based those discussions very much around four case studies. Uh, and then we asked participants to feedback on those case studies. And the aim of this part of the project was to begin exploring uninformed and informed perceptions, aspirations and concerns. The second part of the study was a, a telephone survey. We asked six questions, three of which were attitude statements on a nationally representative survey of a thousand people in, in Great Britain, and that was conducted by the pollsters ICM for us. And the purpose of this part of the project was to provide an early baseline of awareness and attitudes at a national level, and also some context for the dialogue findings. <coughs> So, as you've heard, the context of this dialogue project was very much within the framing of the uh, report, that, that the inquiry that Dick chaired. So we did use the definition that Dick's already put up. Synthetic biology aims to design and engineer biologically based parts, novel devices and systems, as well as redesigning existing natural biological systems. So that was the definition that we were working with um, when we were describing it to members of the public. The dialogue participants, it was held here, so they all came from in and around London, so very much within one region. <coughs> we had nine men and seven women, all aged between 20 and 60, and a cross-section of socio-economic backgrounds. So not a big enough group for us to be able to start saying whether particular attitudes or perspectives were coloured by other characteristics of people. The survey did allow us to start doing that to some extent, but that was also constrained by the fact we asked very few questions. Um, and where appropriate in the report, although I'm not really going to talk about this today, we have compared it to a similarly sized and a quite small um, study that's been done in the US last year by the Woodrow Wilson Center. So just to tell you what the case studies were that we uh, focused on, there was the production of artemisinin, which I think Dick's explained quite well this morning. We also used a case study about detecting toxins and diseases although this was used more actually as a study of what's called garage biology. This was a piece that appeared in The Guardian about a woman in San Francisco doing research in her kitchen. The production of biofuels and the use of synthetic biology for bioremediation. Uh, Paul did actually use some other examples in his presentation, but these were the ones we focused on in the second meeting. So to look at awareness, perceptions and understandings, I think this chart um, shows people were asked how much they'd heard about synthetic biology. And I think the main thing about this chart is it shows you that 67% of people said they hadn't heard anything at all, which is exactly the same percentage of people in the US last year who gave the same answer to the same question. Men were more likely to say that they'd heard something than women, and you can see also there are some differences between age groups. But none of the people who came to the, the meetings here in the public dialogue workshop had heard of synthetic biology. Now, we, we asked the people who came to the meetings and we asked in the survey 
when I say synthetic biology, what words and phrases come to mind? Well, half of the survey respondents said don't know or nothing, and that compared to 30% of people in the US. But people who did say something else uh, were saying things like biology, genetic, synthetic, cloning, body, and man-made. So those were the sorts of things that came to mind when people were, heard the phrase <coughs> synthetic biology. In terms of responses to the survey question, we grouped the responses into some thematic groups. And you can see here that 13% of the respondents said something about artificial, unnatural, man-made. 9% mentioned genetics and, and embryos. 8% mentioned a non-biological science, so maybe chemistry. And 6% mentioned cloning. And very similar themes emerged in the public dialogue. This um, looks at the responses to that question from the, if you like, the other side. This is the frequency that people said different words. And you can see here, synthetic, man-made, biology, genetic and cloning, all in big letters. They were mentioned a lot of times by people. But there's some interesting things coming up um, to a lesser extent. Chemistry, food, heart, life, medical, animals. And that's, that's reproduced in the report, and you can peruse that at your leisure. But I think there's some interesting, smaller words coming up. So we then asked people what they thought synthetic biology might be. And in terms of the survey, people tended to just repeat what they'd said in terms of words and phrases. Again, about half the people said nothing or don't know. There was a lot of repetition. But there was one interesting difference that came out when asked this question as against the words and phrases questionnaire question, which was something to do with transplanting synthetic or animal body parts into humans. And in the dialogue <coughs> um, discussions, people were mentioning things like pacemakers, new heart valves, artificial legs, hip replacements. But this was it was a very positive association. People saw this as progress in healthcare, healthcare improvements, medical breakthroughs. So it was coming from a very positive perspective in the dialogue discussions. Um, participants informed perceptions and understandings. Well, certainly the dialogue participants struggled to understand synthetic biology. And certainly initially, I mean, although obviously it was <coughs> They were given the particular examples in the particular presentation, but I think when you strip away that, there definitely was a confusion with stem cell technology. And the difference between actually making the, the cell into something that is what you want to use, as against using a biological system to produce the thing that you want to use, as in a, a biofuel. But by the end of the two evening sessions, I think people had a much clearer understanding aided by the case studies, because the case studies allowed us, if you like, to describe the synthetic biology from different perspectives and in different ways, and that helped people eventually to get to grips with it. And at the end, uh, before people left, I asked them what they thought um, synthetic biology was. And one man said, tweaking an organism to do something different. And we also gave people a feedback questionnaire at the very end of the process, and asked them, uh, they were anonymous questionnaires, asked them to write in what they thought it was, and here's one um, example, re-engineering biology or organisms to perform in a way specified by scientists and act in a particular and predictable way to improve an area of, of application. So attitudes to creating and modifying life, well, first of all, creating life. Perhaps surprisingly, our participants were quite excited by the idea, very futuristic, <laughs> exciting, more exciting than destroying life. Um, but this was only in the context of creating bacteria and other microorganisms. I think right from the beginning, because of Paul's presentation, people had understood it as within that framework and certainly not creating higher organi organisms and especially not um, anything to do with creating or modifying people. We tried to get a handle on um, perspectives on what I suppose we saw very much as the core of synthetic biology through these three attitude statements in the survey. So we asked people the extent whether they agreed strongly, agreed, neither agreed nor disagreed, disagreed or disagreed strongly with each of these three attitude statements. 
So redesigning an existing microorganism so that it produces medicines and biofuels should not be allowed. 46% of people disagreed with that, although a quarter agreed. Creating new man-made microorganisms that will produce medicines or biofuels should be supported. 63% agreed with that, although one in seven disagreed. And then, taken without a context, the idea of a man-made microorganism is worrying. That might appear slightly contradictory there, 39% of people agreeing with that, but, it, but it, I think our conclusion from that is that context and usefulness is actually quite important um, to people, as I think was one of the questions related to. The other thing about um, this chart is that, for those of you good at arithmetic, we haven't actually included the people who said neither nor. And quite a lot of people said that they neither agreed nor disagreed with those statements. And that's quite interesting, people actually wanting to, th to think about it a bit and not just launching into any old answer because they'd been asked a question. <coughs> and the last thing to say about this chart is that if you dig down into the data, you find that the people who disagree with the first statement agree with the second and disagree with the third tend to be young, well-educated, professional men. So just to take you through some of the key um, findings, the participants in the dialogue meetings could see great potential benefits of synthetic biology, but they were very wary of releases into the environment. They were quite happy with the idea of big vats of microorganisms producing artemisinin or producing biofuels, but releasing microorganisms into the environment to deal with environmental cleanup was quite a different issue for them. They, they accepted that it might be in a vat and there might be an accident, fair enough, but the deliberate release into the environment was something that people really drew back from. There was little concern about bioterrorism, in fact it, was, it wasn't um, <coughs> mentioned at all, and indeed the reactions before Jane, because Jane, uh, Paul presented first, the reactions were all very positive until Jane started to say, well, what about this and what about this? Um, but with respect to bioterrorism, I think people felt that they were in, in discussion with the, with the people who were there, already enough um, terrorist tools out there, and this wasn't really adding very much to the arsenal. Um, but there was a lot of concern about access. They weren't uh, at all happy about the idea of anybody being able to access the technology. They felt it should be done in established, regulated laboratories by people with proper qualifications. So the idea of the, the example of the woman doing, um, making, doing synthetic biology research in her kitchen, they found quite frightening and really wouldn't want to live next door to her. <laughs> um, they wanted rigorous testing of the products. Just because artemisinin already exists, doesn't, they felt that if it was being produced through a new system, it needed to be tested and effectively treated as a new product and go through sort of new product uh, testing. They highlighted the need for the right level of regulation. So yes, they, they wanted some regulation, some controls, particularly on, on access, but they didn't want so <coughs> much regulation that the field couldn't develop and that people weren't going to be able to do research and take things forward. And similarly, they, when, it, when we looked at IP and, and patenting issues, they felt that if people were investing their time and money in the development of synthetic biology, they, then, they deserved some return on that investment, but not to the extent of being able to exclude other people from being involved um, or, and for the field to develop and new applications to be developed. <coughs> So just to remind you what the four case studies were, the artemisinin, garage biology, biofuels and bioremediation, um, got some feedback specifically around those uh, four case studies from the participants. Well, the <coughs> Academy was very interested in what, what people's hopes for the technology are. And interestingly, and perhaps not unexpectedly, the, the first thing that really struck people was the medical applications. People were very supportive of the medical applications. But by the end of the two discussion meetings, biofuels really came out on top. More of the participants, well, far more actually of the participants, wanted biofuels to succeed um, because they felt more people would benefit. 
And that was quite an important thing for them, the number of people who would benefit from a technology. Yes, they mentioned climate change and they mentioned that um, oil uh, stocks are running low, but it was really the number of people who were going to benefit that tipped the balance for them. In terms of expectations, they expected multinational companies to be driving investment and development <coughs> um, and qualified scientists, not, not biohackers, but they did expect that the media would pick up on any negatives. They didn't actually want any of the applications, not even the bioremediation one, although they were more worried about that, to be stopped. Um, but, and they, they thought the testing in going forward was very important. And we asked them if they had any recommendations for scientists and engineers, government and policy makers, and their friends and relatives. With respect to scientists and engineers, they thought that they needed to start raising public awareness and providing information. And I think everybody went home and Googled synthetic biology between the two sessions. And they couldn't find anything that was targeted at a lay audience. It was all quite technical information that they were able to find. With respect to uh, government, obviously they wanted government to act in the best interests of the population. <coughs> but they wanted government to invest in the field, partly because of the potential benefits which they um, understood from the discussions, but also because government involvement as an investor would allow it to keep up to date with what was going on and give it some remit for um, keeping regulation under review. And with respect to friends and relatives, they thought people needed to be quite open-minded and should take an interest. Now, our analysis of the attitudes that, that we found, I think this is a, a summary really, we thought they depended very much on two things. Trust in synthetic biologists, could these people really create microorganisms that they could control to the extent to which they claimed to be able to control them? And what were the benefits likely to be? And people explicitly said, it doesn't really matter if we understand the nitty gritty of the science. What we need to want, that's really, that was really a secondary level thing. I mean, some people did, and I think some people was, were still struggling at, towards the end. But that wasn't really what it was about. It was about, given what the benefits are, are the risks, which can be understood without understanding the details of the science, worth the benefits. So just to draw that together into some conclusions, this ex it is an exploratory project, but it does seem to indicate that the majority of the public are supportive, at least in principle, of the creation and use of microorganisms as a means of producing useful products. Indeed, they perceive that this is already going on in terms of <coughs> water pur purification. People appear to be less at ease with the idea of modifying existing <coughs> organisms than creating new ones. More acceptable in a closed environment, um, concern about bioremediation. And some, um, we thought synthetic biology could be conditional on the actual benefits that, that it's likely to bring. And negative publicity could change this broadly positive view if issues are raised that people don't consider spontaneously. And I think particularly with some of the people who found it more difficult to understand, their attitudes were swinging backwards and forwards as they were trying to understand it more um, and get to grips with, with what was going on. So some ideas for further research and certainly things I'd be interested in finding out more about. How do people determine whether something is alive and whether or microorganisms are seen to be alive? We tried for it to, to explore this with our participants, but they didn't really bite on it. We did manage to um, talk about whether microorganisms were alive, and I think the consensus was that they're not. People equated it with making cakes and things like that, um, with yeast. Uh, but I think we, that could be explored a bit further. Why there appear to be different reactions to modifying an existing organism, uh, modifying organisms and creating organisms, I think is something we weren't able to explore because that really came out of the survey and the, we, by that time the participant, the dialogue exercise had finished so we weren't able to follow that up. Why are there differences between men and women in age groups and across the UK? And I think to some extent people's, we had to, unpack from people their slight confusion as to why this was being done by academics and not by industry 
and what is a qualified scientist. And I think a bit more understanding of that context would be quite useful. And that's it. <laughs> well, I knew you were in the chair, so. <laughs> um, so we've got, we've got five minutes for the questions. Um, I mean, one of the things I suppose, of course, to me, in your introduction is whether you would like to amplify some comments about the applications of synthetic biology. Uh, I mean, you mentioned two applications that are in the pipeline. Um, clearly, there are other ways of making um, uh, you know, the higher order alcohols. Yes. Um, yeah, so, so if we just address, I mean, let's take the uh, biofuels and maybe take the malaria example. Let me do the malaria first. Um, you probably are aware of the fact, uh, well, I've already said that Jay Keesling at Berkeley is the person who's produced this, and Paul and I and others like Jane know, know him well. Um, you probably may have heard on the Stay program a couple of weeks ago that um, some of the natural uh, artemisinin-based uh, you know, drugs are now um, becoming less effective because malaria is adapting. Um, Jay actually gave a talk at Imperial about three weeks ago, and uh, what he, what he actually, one of the things he showed in the talk was that um, by using the, the approach of standard parts, devices, and systems, which he is now absolutely applying to uh, the artemisinin, the synthetic artemisinin, uh, it, that has much more potential actually to adapt you can adapt it much more easily, the synthetic drug much more easily to the ad adapted uh, malaria. So, you know, that's one, that's one example. In terms of the biofuels, uh, as I've already said, let's just amplify that a bit. Uh, you know, if you read in the, you, you'll read the newspapers, you will see that so one of the concerns about biofuels is the amount of land that is now being taken up to produce biofuels. Uh, this is because essentially these techniques, well, let's say the ethanol type techniques, uh, are very inefficient, as I've said. They, about so roughly 10% of the, the biomass of the plant is actually used to convert to ethanol, so that means that 90% of it is essentially thrown away, but you've still got to grow it. Uh, with the uh, synthetic biology techniques, the, uh, the aim, and this is in the relatively near future, actually, uh, is to really turn that around so that 90% um, of the plant is used and only 10% is thrown away, and so it becomes a much more efficient process uh, and it takes up far less land. So there are two examples. Uh, a couple of other examples, uh, sort of more in the medical area. Uh, for example, Jane's colleagues at Edinburgh, uh, you know, have developed a very effective synthetic biology-based sensor which detects arsenic in, in, in water. And uh, this is particularly important. This is one of the areas of application in, in, uh, in Bangladesh because, uh, you know, people in Bangladesh are at work actually drinking water that was full of arsenic and obviously suffering severe health problems. They've been using these techniques, they've been able to develop uh, really an inexpensive and highly effective method of detecting arsenic in water. And then fin sorry, finally, I'll just say that you know, Paul and I with our colleagues have developed uh, a synthetically based biosensor for detecting urinary tract infection, which is a pretty severe problem in hospitals all around London. Sorry. My microphone is now on. It makes no difference, of course. I wouldn't have known that, would I? Um, the gentleman here first, and thank you. And it might be perhaps if people are going to ask questions that they just introduce who they are, where they're from, would be the right thing. Okay, um, uh, Alan Powderham. Um, I'm from uh, Mott MacDonald. Uh, I'm an engineer, and I'm going to ask a, an engineering-related question. Um, naturally, in your talk, and it was a f uh, fascination uh, to me uh, in the connection and the dialogue between science and engineering, you, you're bringing to synthetic biology an engineering approach, and you outline the uh, general process. But obviously, this subject is potentially very controversial. Uh, there's innovation, and it's <coughs> going to get a lot of attention. 
are you, uh, can you see the, uh, a major contribution coming from engineering in our risk uh, approach, the way we manage risk uh, in this context as well? And could you give them a brief uh, insight into that? Thank you. Yes. Um, well, I mean, you've just raised a very important point, and this is obviously central to um, most of engineering design nowadays, how you manage and minimise risk. <clears throat> and certainly, I mean, that is built into the way in which we approach these problems. Uh, so let me say that um, uh, you know one of the ways in which we minimise risk, of course, is that, and I want to bring this out, that um, you know the work that's done in these areas uh, is done in highly controlled laboratories, uh, typically in places like Imperial College, which uh, operate under very strict Home Office rules, etc. Um, so uh, that's one area in which you, you, one can reduce risk. Um, another area is that uh, we can engineer into these devices uh, the ability to, um, uh, they naturally die, if I can put it that way, when they're outside their normal environment. So we build in those kind of things into the design. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. I'm Angela Newson from the University of Bristol and from September I'll be leading a European project on ethics and synthetic biology. My question actually leads on quite nicely from the first one, which is I just wanted you to elaborate a little bit on what you see as the specific advantages of an engineering approach to synthetic biology as opposed to some of the other options that you canvassed. And obviously one of those reasons might be the specific approach to risk, but are there any other advantages that you'd like to elaborate? Well, I mean, the key, the key advantage from an engineering point of view is, as I say, the, this, this core concept, you know, which applies to everything from motor cars to jumbo jets to wristwatches, you know, you name it, the same <coughs> principles are applied, that you, when you're designing any of these devices or systems, you don't go back to square one. You put them together, you know, from well-defined components. And uh, that is, a, that, I mean, it sounds obvious, but when you talk to people in the field, they come back all the time to the fact that that is the, you know, the key difference. You know, if you take genetic engineering, for example, what you're modifying there is a few genes. This is a, actually a totally different approach. You know, what you're doing is providing a registry or a catalog of standard parts which you can then put together in the way that you put together things in terms of normal engineering. And that, that is, you know, put, I mean, as the chairman said, I mean, there's a long way to go, but that, that is the way that you approach this. And I suppose as a engineer and a fellow of the Royal Academy, I would argue that uh, it's hard to think of basically any field in engineering where there have been major advances without taking that approach. We've got time for one more quick question and one more quick answer, but don't forget there's going to be a panel discussion when you'll have a chance to reiterate the questions again, but there's a gentleman just there, um, halfway down. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Well, thinking about this question of risk, sorry, my name is Sandy Starr, I work for the Progress Educational Trust. Thinking about this question of risk in your parallel with 19th century um, synthetic chemistry, um, I was wondering what you thought about the differences uh, between the um, sort of public perception and, and sensitivities surrounding synthetic chemistry in that historical era and, and, and what faces synthetic biology, particularly because I think synthesis and artifice as ideas have come in for a bit of a knocking in this day and age, um, even more so than in the 19th century, although there were superstitions then. Um, and, well, I'd be interested in your thoughts on the parallel. Well, I mean, I think the parallel there is probably, uh, in the 19th century, it was a, an informed minority that really had uh, tried to have a major effect on this. The difference here is that we are trying to engage the general public actually uh, right from the start and in terms of uh, for example the EPSERC Centre I mean we're in partnership uh, with the uh, LSE um, who are a partners in looking at the ethics of this who are looking at public engagement it's the sort of thing that uh, Jane does in great detail as well up in Edinburgh so that's a big difference you know we're trying we are really trying to engage the public in in you know, intelligent debate, which is why we're having the meeting this morning in, in the whole area of risk. And i just make one final point. The, the key reason for that, and I believe this passionately, is not so that, you know, we can tell the general public what should be done. The whole point is that the general public who are, you know, we know are typically very intelligent people in other fields can actually tell us what they think and where the risks lie. Richard, thank you very much indeed. <coughs> that leads on extremely well. I'm very grateful to you. Um, our next speaker is thanks, Jane. Any questions? Yes, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Adam Zaretsky, uh, visiting from New York. Howdy. Um, 
how do I say, I'm interested in the difference between genetic engineering and synthetic, synthetic biology, but that's too easy a question <laughs> because the differences, I mean, seem to be that things are standardized a little bit more than in genetic and engineering. So I want to actually maybe emphasize the similarities because genetic engineering is almost an equal terminology to synthetic biology. And uh, to change the name, like an upstream promoter of a gene to a part, a, say part of a transistor, and to change the name of uh, an inserted gene into a, a device and a, a workhorse for molecular biology into a system doesn't seem to be that different to me. Well, I'm probably not the right person to answer that, but I do think, uh, yeah, Paul is going to step up. But um, there is a real attempt to apply genuine engineering principles to biology. <coughs> the, the principles Dick talked about, um, abstraction, standardization, <coughs> those kind of things, in a way that hasn't been done with genetic engineering, which is a, a kind of tinkering. Um, oh, there's, a, there's a comedian who said, um, if... Uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you ask a genetic engineer to create a bridge, they'll throw a load of boulders in the water, and if you can walk across it, you call it a bridge. But if an engineer is going to do a bridge, they're going to write a design, they're going to develop it, and they're going to actually have a proper bridge. So, do you want to...? Well, there's no engineering in genetic engineering. Well, I mean, lambda phage seems rather engineered and is being used in synthetic biology every day. It just it is one of the standardized parts now, and it was fairly well spelled out since the 70s. I'm just. Well, I think the, the main difference is that um, if you're a microbiologist, you set up the standards, you're not going to do some detailed mathematical simulation or modeling of the outcome of your experiment. And I think you know I think you've got to remember that engineers actually tend to try and simulate and model the designs that they're trying to build, and that's a major distinction. I mean. But I, I know what you're saying because we get it all the time from people. Join, join us, I think, is the way. <laughs> really, don't resist. Other in systems, in systems biologists in the audience. Yes, they should join as well. Hi, my name is Steve, and I'm from the Royal College of Art. Um, from the Royal College of Art. Thank you. Um, my question is, the, this report's called um, Engaging with Synthetic Biology, but the majority of the public probably doesn't want to engage with synthetic biology. They probably want to engage with the implications of synthetic biology. Um, and as you say, they're, they're kind of speculative, and, and that's in a way engaging with the future. So how do we engage with the future, and how do you have people engaging with the implications of synthetic biology as opposed to with the actual kind of genes and, and, and cogs of it? I think that's a really good question, and I think, um, yeah, this is the central issue in engaging with the implications of a technology like synthetic biology, when you're just talking about this might happen, this might not happen, um, how, how do you engage around that? I don't, yeah, I think it's a very good question that we should ask. It's something we've discussed at the EPSRC at length. Um, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Go in too early, you raise public fear when you've got no reason to do so. If you don't raise the thing on public fair afterwards, then of course you've, you know, you've created a spectre. So it's, a, it's, I think it's a, it's a massively important question. Any other questions? We've got time for one more. Uh, um, yeah, uh, should that one go to somebody who hasn't asked a question yet? Forgive me. Uh, hi, uh, Sarah Franklin, anthropologist, LSE. Um, I wanted to ask you about the um, figuration of biology versus engineering, which I completely understand in your, in your wonderful talk that you were using to illustrate the ways in which these are seen as being quite different things. Um, and uh, Professor Kitney used the same figure in his slide, bi Biology V, um, engineering. And I, I just wondered if um, there's another sense in which these two things are really um, becoming more similar, um, not becoming more opposed. And, and the example I wanted to um, think of is an example um, Prof Professor Winston um, might help us with, which is the in vitro culture system um, as a way of modeling, for example, biological processes of embryos or cells. Because, because here, you, oh, you don't have a strictly engineered system. 
in the sense that you don't have a calculated algorithmically defined system of, say, um, culture. But in terms of culture modeling, the relationship between biology and its instrumentation is back and forth. So there's a great deal of imitation, for example, in a, in a culture system between what would happen in vivo and what would happen in vitro. In fact, the whole point of an in vitro model isn't necessarily that it's opposed to an in vivo model. It's supposed to, in some ways, be identical. And in order to achieve IVF, which is often described as a bridge to a new life, um, precisely what you want is that identity between the so-called artificial uh, system and its so-called natural counterpart. So in a way, synthetic biology is the synthesis of those two things uh, rather than their um, opposition. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting perspective and it reminds me of systems biology, which is um, another area of biology which utilizes modeling um, extensively and um, arguably synthetic biology is the real world application of systems biology. I think um, systems biology it embraces things like emergent properties and complexity in a way which an engineering vision maybe doesn't, although um, lots of uh, Synthetic biologists are, like Paul, are also systems biologists, so they're trying to bring them together. But yeah, maybe that opposition uh, was too crude in this new age of the biological sciences. Uh, and I suppose if I might interject very briefly, uh, seeing as you mentioned the model of embryology, one of the things that we learned as embryologists was that actually, no matter how carefully you replicate the system that you believe that you've got in vitro, your in vivo system doesn't actually reproduce that properly. And that's been a constant problem, I think, in many areas of medicine. Uh, cancer biology, for example, where you have a model for a particular DNA sequence where you know a gene, uh, where an, a, an animal will respond to an oncological agent perfectly uh, because of the gene sequence. When you put it to the human, you don't get the same response, and it's very, very puzzling. So I think, as a model for synthetic biology, this is clearly going to be one of the issues about uh, and maybe we'll be starting to think of biology much more in terms of things like quantum in due course. The uncertainty of what we do will be, I think, increased as we understand more, probably. Jen, thank you very much indeed. One of the things that um, Professor Cathy Sykes from the University of Bristol um, argues about public dialogue is that it informs the scientists about uh, how their research might actually be improved. <coughs> Do you think you could argue uh, that that might have had any relevance here with this particular exercise so far? Would you like to address that? I'm not sure, really, but, but I think that might be a better question for Paul, who was actually there for a lot of it. Do you think it has? Um, it's an interesting question. I don't think there was a long enough time to yeah. explore that. To be honest, and as you pointed out on the first part of your uh, introduction, the field is is very young, and so um, to actually influence the quality of the science we're doing it's in an emerging soon. field, it's probably it's too, too soon. soon. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, th I think this is very upstream mm. at, at the moment. We've got lots of hands up, Philippa. You, you, I think you're first. Philippa Lenzos from the Bio Center at the LSC. Um, Thanks very much for your presentation. This might be a bit of an unfair question because there's no easy answer to it, but I, I still think it's, it's worth raising. And it relates to kind of, well, where do we go from here? Because it's, it's, it's a great introductory study um, that you've presented. Um, and and uh, one of the things you said was that uh, the participants were quite positive following Paul's talk, but once, once Jane came in, and kind of raised some of the concerns, they were less positive. And, and Jane, of course, is someone who's, who thinks through the implications of this new technology uh, as part of her job. So my, my question to you is really, how do we balance the concerns that are raised by the public with the concerns that are raised by professionals who think about these things on a daily basis, so sociologists, so uh, historians, so philosophers, um, ethicists and, and, and so on um, and, and <coughs> particularly how do we balance these things if, if, if the concerns don't align do we, do we then pick and choose between which concerns we respond to or, or how, do we, how would we deal with that Can I ask Leslie to answer that first? Sure, 
Um, we had in the original presentations, Jane brought it up, and in the case studies, we kept bringing up this, what do you think about creating life? Do you think the playing God? La la. And no one bit, though, our 16 dialogue participants, no one was appeared very religious for a start. And one actually said, oh, perhaps if you had religious people here, they, they would think in those terms. But that was something that I thought was, was very profound, the fact that an awful lot of philosophers are talked about this, you know, it will redefine what, it, what life means. And actually, for our 16 dialogue participants, it just it wasn't an issue for them. It wasn't an issue. And how we balance that, we carry on the conversation for now. But I think it, it is worth adding that participants were happy for other people to do some of that thinking for them. They explicitly said that. I hadn't thought about that. But it's good to know pe other people are thinking about that. Yeah. Uh, Alan Malcolm from the Institute of Biology. Thank you, Suzanne. One of the points you raised right at the end was what the public's perception of a qualified scientist is. I'm very conscious that Robert Winston is not allowed to practice his profession without having a government license to do so, which not only tests competence, but also tests ethical approach. And that's also true of lawyers and engineers. <coughs> but as far as I know, any Tom, Dick and Harry can set up physics, chemistry or biology in his kitchen or her kitchen or garden shed. Did you perceive in your conversations with the public that there's an attitude that we actually ought to be rather tighter in our definition and criteria for practicing science? Well, certainly um, people were, were not happy with the idea that somebody could be doing anything like this or, in fact, any other experiments in their garage or their, or their kitchen. Um, and that's, I think, about as far as we can take it in this. We didn't actually go in and say, well, what do you I thought think that's what that? fusion cooking was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the reason we brought that up in the last bullet point was because it was only when we were analysing the results that we realised quite a few times people had said, oh, we want bona fide scientists to do this, and, and, and the legitimate scientist was the other word. And then we thought, actually, for further studies, it would be really nice to explore what people thought a legitimate scientist was. Is it, would they see, you know, big farmer as their scientist, but it's all profit, were they legitimate, or is it, you know, pure academics, or... Could people with, I mean, I think the example that was in the paper, I think that student, the one that was trying to do it in the kitchen, I think she was a PhD student as well. And there was also about the whole idea of open access and garage biology. I was chatting to another synthetic biologist who actually knows, um, has an American colleague with a lab at his home. And talking about working at home, and whether, you know, what counts as legitimate research, where should it be done, and, and who's doing it, was what we want to explore further. I, I, mean, I think it's a, a remarkably interesting question, that, and I think it may well be that it's possibly that universities are going to change in the way they educate science undergraduates. Uh, one might think there might be some benefit in doing that. You know, there's already this notion of having an ethical framework for science, which one signs up to as a scientist, which has been promulgated by the Royal Society. I mean, maybe that's the way forward. I don't know. It's an interesting question. Gentlemen at the back. Thank you. Um, I'm Steve Heggie, a biological physics scientist at the University of Oxford. Um, what I think none of the speakers have, at all have mentioned today is um, the concept of enhancing human performance beyond what is currently possible. Um, <coughs> was there anything about the public perception of whether that's a good thing, whether it's likely to happen? I, I think it will happen eventually, but what do we do and how do we prepare ourselves for it? I mean, well, in terms of the, the, um, the 16 participants, it was very much not on... Well, in the report, you'll see there's some discussion about eugenics. And it's very, they, they were enthusiastic about the use of microorganisms for these and some, the technologies we've discussed and some others which um, Paul used as examples. But they were, not in, they were very clear this was not about enhancing humans. They were supportive of that. They cited examples where, you know, of, of eugenics and the Second World War, and so it was. They were they were drawing quite a definite line around that. Though I would say we did bring have a case study, or we talked about a very futuristic application, that in which we could have synthetic biology biodetectors or biosensors in your body that would be able to detect and somehow alert where cancer was, and potentially release the drug at the site. So they would have them, and we brought that up. And there was an initial yuck factor. But there was also people that thought this was a really good idea. I mean, you could think of that as human enhancement, but we didn't go down the route of 
as, as in the way we were talking about redesigning bacteria and yeast, we didn't talk about humans in that way. They did bring it up, but we said, oh, we're not quite, you know, we're not quite there yet. Just got time for one more. I'm sure we're going to come back to that. It's just about the impact of the... Thank you, uh, George Gaskell, London School of Economics. Uh, it seems to me, listening to your uh, presentation of public concerns, that they're very similar to the concerns one heard around genetic engineering and more recently around nanotechnology. And I, I wonder if one of the take-home messages comes from nanotechnology uh, in the sense that people recognize there were some quite serious possible risks, particularly toxicological. And that was recognized three years ago, nothing has happened. The House <coughs> of Lords inquiry at the moment into nanotechnology, European Commission has just brought out some recommendations, is saying, well, we just don't know what the risks are. And I think there might be a lesson for synthetic biology not to just sweep things under the carpet in a sort of general enthusiasm for all the possible benefits of a technology whilst forgetting that most technologies have downsides and it's probably a good idea to uh, pay attention to them. I, I mean, I, I, I'm sort of kind of tempted to call in Peter Ferris at this moment because he uh, has been intimately connected with the EPSRC's uh, public dialogue on nanotechnology, which of course was, uh, I think, rather a successful um, dialogue process. Do you want to comment on that, Peter? Yeah, only in a slightly quite different because it's focused on trying to inform specific core funding for our research, and it was around the area of medical and healthcare, um, and it wasn't about trying to assess general public, public aspirations about that technology. The focus on a very particular area of science and asking the public, where would you like that funding to be directed? And actually, the outcome from that was very important, and actually did change the way we made that call for the funding. Ladies, do you want to answer very quickly or comment? Well, I think I would just agree with George that there, you can see same, some of the same themes <coughs> coming out from, from all these different new technologies. And in fact, something that um, came out of the dialogue, which um, I didn't mention, was that to some extent this was not unexpected. People put the idea of synthetic biology, albeit they hadn't heard of it until they had turned up here in March. Within the context of they, they knew about Dolly, they knew about stem cells, and to them it was another sort of step on the road forward. And so it, it wasn't something that came out of left field as perhaps the, the uh, you know, Dolly might have done in the 1990s. It was, it, was it was part of what people were beginning to expect. Oh yeah, well there, there's always new things coming out in biology, there'll be some new developments. So, it, um, so I think there are a lot of commonalities and people are beginning to have a frame, framework in their minds to fit it into. Important question. Thank you very much for that. Um, Leslie and Suzanne, thank you very much indeed. Okay, start with a couple of quotes just completely confirming what people have said today, that this is one of those areas of new technology, new science that could go horribly wrong and that's widely acknowledged by observers and journalists. It could be wonderful but it's got all the potential, it's got all the ingredients to be the next big scare story. Uh, one there from Roger Highfield. I've got all these slides if, if people can't take in all the information. I've got to speak really quickly because I've only got five minutes and loads to say. Um, again there, just identifying that this could be wonderful or it could be an absolute nightmare. So here's my five top tips on how to ensure that synthetic biology does not become the next GM. First, go early. People have said it already, you're never too early. One of the big untold stories of the HFE bill and the whole debate about human-animal hybrid is that it was scientists who briefed the media about this in the first place. Um, at a little unnoticed uh, briefing back in 2005, three scientists basically sat there and told uh, many of our key science and health reporters about mixes of human and animal material. It wasn't on the media's agenda, it wasn't on the policy agenda, it wasn't on the political agenda. They were talking to journalists about it, and I think that's really important. Um, good set of journalists there, the specialist science and health people came along to hear them. So by the time everybody starts the timeline of the HFE bill, when, was it, was it December 2007 when oh, the first draft of the bill came out? It was, well, it was, yeah, it was, um, yeah. 
I know it was before Christmas because I was it, talking it about it after Christmas, Christmas party. Year, yeah, That's right. So basically, it comes out and DH say we are going to ban this area of research because we've looked at the public consultation and it's one step too far. It's the yuck factor. They don't want it. We uh, indicate that we will move to ban this. By the time that happened, most of the journalists who reported on that ban had been at that briefing with the scientists. They understood the basic science of human-animal embryos and they liked the scientists. A really important thing, I would say. They liked them, they trusted them, they knew them because they'd gone early. So that's a big key message. Uh, uh, I don't think to this audience this is kind of given, uh, but it's really important. We, we looked at how many briefings we've done on nanotechnology, and we've done about 10 in two years, and nine of them have been about the dangers of nanotechnology, the risks of nanoparticles, the risks of not engaging with the public, the risks of not uh, getting the right regulatory framework. That's great, that's wonderful, and we've embraced all of those, but actually when the public come to do this risk-benefit analysis, they need to know why we want this regulation, why we want this science, because there are benefits as well. Uh, just a quick example from one of our briefings, nanotechnology and food. This was the one, I think, uh, where it actually talked about the potential benefits. Um, can't go through these, so I'll make these slides available to anyone. But basically saying um, there are real benefits in terms of food safety, um, future few foods, uh, nutritious foods, etc., by using nanotechnology. They're the journalists. Um, again, GM, so much over the last five years about the dangers, the risks, the need for regulation, the need for public engagement. Fine, but please, when there is a paper coming out um, in a journal or there is a conference, get out there and make sure that they also hear um, that GM can be a public good, can bring benefits, can move on from just increasing yields to actually um, tackling things like our obesity crisis, etc. Um, there you go, really, really quickly, lovely headlines. When you give them a good story, the journalists are very pliable. Uh, uh, not all of them, obviously, very critical journalists in the audience. On the whole, they take the message as given by the scientists. But equally brief on the risk. This is really, really important. Don't, don't say, oh my God, I can't let them see that paper that shows that GM is going to cross-fertilise with the other things. Let's just put that on the website because someone else will find it. They will take it to their friendly journalists and it will be in the media. Um, if scientists are looking for the risks, you should be shouting. It's not just Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth who care about risks. You care about them and your best place to identify them through your research. So absolutely shout about it when you find risks. Um, this was Ken Donaldson from Edinburgh on his paper published in Nature showing that nanoparticles could have asbestos-like effects in the lung. It doesn't get scarier than that, okay? Um, but because he did it in the right context, because he showed all the caveats, because he said it's only in mice, it's not yet in humans, nanoparticles, the real risk would be to people working with them, not in the atmosphere. There's more nanoparticles behind a taxi in London than there is from these, you know, all of those things. If scientists brief on the risk, they give a much more balanced um, um, accurate view of that risk, but they should be shouting about them when they find them. That's a critical point. Again, there's a. Am I over time already? Uh, okay, I'll oh, give you 60 what, seconds. What point am One I minute. on? Number three or four? You're okay. on, you've just done three. Four. See, every threat is an opportunity. This is just my excuse to um, have a go at Prince Charles. I know Robert Winston loves him as well. Um, during the GM thing, many of the best plant scientists in this country ran the other way, and I know that because I've spoken to them. In John Inez, in Rothamsted, wonderful, amazing, lovely scientists did not engage with the debate. They saw it only as a threat. They didn't see it as an opportunity to talk about their science to the world. That has now changed. Um, and actually, I was lying on a beach in France, but when Prince Charles had a complete hissy fit, and I think it's on YouTube if you want to see it, literally jumping about in his seat um, over last summer saying, GM is responsible for climate change, it's responsible for environmental degradation, it is the bane of our lives. Um, we found all of these scientists, many of whom I know, ran the other way in 1999. And they said, do we really want to comment on Prince Charles? Is this going to be a story tomorrow? It's already been in the papers. Yes, 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 to all of those. And guess what? They changed the headline. They changed what the public saw and heard the next day. Every single headline, look at them. I can't take any more time because Robert will kill me. But basically, these headlines are about the scientists. Uh, and that's what most of the public are. Be for the right journalists. I just want to say, um, champion your science, health and environment specialist journalists. They are shop stewards for science within their newsroom. Most of their news editors hate them because they keep saying, this is the way science works, you're getting that wrong, don't put that headline on. Um, and yet a lot of you don't treat them with that respect. You complain about the headline rather than helping with them. So yeah, that's it. yeah, I've got to go. Thanks, Rob. Robin Gill, who's... Um uh, uh, an Anglican priest, and uh, as I say, from the University of Kent. Robin, over to you. Okay, right. um, I think I would say at the outset, uh, echo what uh, Lord Winston said at the very beginning of this um, consultation, 
that it's really excellent um, uh, that at the beginning of a, a new science, um, we're addressing eth questions of ethical responsibility. Um, I think that's very important indeed. And full marks to the report. I think it's an excellent report, and I think the ethics section, thanks to Jane, is, is also um, very good indeed. Um, it does raise a number of issues, and it's a pity Jane didn't talk about them, but, and, uh, but, but it does raise a number of serious ethical issues. I, I can think back 20 years ago when I first started getting involved as an ethicist in areas like this. Um, I was at Newcastle University. They were in the early days of GM seed production. Um, there were talks about environmental, the risks of environmental risk. Um, I found the scientists at that stage were completely divided. They all agreed there were questions of risk. They didn't agree there were questions of ethics involved in this. Half of them thought, yes, it did involve ethics. The other half thought, no, it's just about risk and risk assessment. I suppose at that side, from the ethical side, we were dumb enough not to sort of make the obvious connection that you don't do risky things unless there is a benefit. Uh, as Fiona's just said, uh, uh, using the word benefit, you're clearly making a value judgment. You're clearly making ethical judgments. If we'd realized that at the time, perhaps we could have got a bit further with the ethical discussion. Now, those days have passed, and, and this is a very good example of that, where we have ethics right up front being recognized that the risks involved must be measured against, uh, balanced against benefits. And that's been important in informing the discussion. And clearly, there are some risks. Uh, we haven't been into those today. Um, but the, the, the fact that uh, synthetic production of the polio virus, um, uh, synthetic production perhaps of the 1918 flu virus, um, have raised uh, serious eth ethical questions about risk and the management of risk. Um, Biosecurity was rather dismissed by the participants. Uh, well, the answer is not in America. Um, that's probably one of the biggest ethical questions that's raised in America in, in the context of synthetic biology. Um, the garage production, um, the, the ability of individuals to produce harmful agents, uh, has reminded us yet again, as we shouldn't have needed reminding, um, Ian Barber was writing about this 20, 30 years ago, that technology is neither good nor bad, it is power. And power can be used or misused. That applies to the computer, which can be used for, for benefit all of us. It can be used to download pornography, and it can be used to facilitate uh, 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 terrorism. We know that. So technology always carries that double edge of, being, of, of power, which can be used or misused. I believe it's ethical science must recognize that, as you are recognizing that, uh, be explicit about that, and make sure that your governance procedures uh, are robust enough to control it where you can control it. Now, all that's absolutely essential um, and, and very important indeed. Um, there are, there's other language which occasionally has resurf surfaced in this consultation. It was there in that wonderful picture of Craig Venter of the Time magazine uh, where there are two wonderful metaphors used. The first is he's, he's playing God, and the second is that he's creating new life. Um, as a theologian, I, I'd, I'd put a sort of a reservation about both of those claims. Um, they seem to me to be clearly metaphors. Um, I think, I think, I can be correct on this, I think the first uh, ethicist or theologian to use the term playing God in this context was the later uh, and great uh, American theologian, Paul Ramsey, who in the very earliest days of IVF uh, produced a book called Fabricated Man, that will tell you the age of the book, uh, 1970, in which he looked to the future and saw some of the things that were already happening, beginning to happen in terms of IVF, um, um, and, and fairly accurately, on the basis of the scientists, saw some of the things that were going to happen, but accused the scientists of playing God. Uh, that's quite instructive, uh, because to my mind, he was, with hindsight, obviously wrong. Um, IVF has brought huge benefits. Of course there are risks, <coughs> and perhaps not all of them are known, um, but it's also brought huge benefit. But then it was a metaphor he was using in the first place that I think the notion of playing God, um, taken too literally, would really get rid of most of medicine and probably all of surgery. Um, 
Uh, <coughs> so, so just be careful with that kind of hyperbole. The other bit of hyperbole, which I think you committed yourself many times over, is talking about creating life. Well, again, as a theologian, that's not how I use the word creation. For me, creation is producing something from nothing, uh, not uh, bringing existing things together or redesigning. Um, I'd be happier with the word production or, or redesigning or modifying, um, all those words. Creation has, for me, means other things which, uh, which I think are not implied. Again, and I think that, that sort of shades the debate and, and produces a kind of hype and hyperbole which I think is deeply unhelpful. Because I think um, <coughs> what is, is important here is, that, is ethical responsibility. Behaving responsibly as scientists, recognizing and being upfront about the, the, the as Fiona said, about the, the risks but also the benefits, uh, trying to get a perception of that. But, and this is also a big but, having robust governance mechanisms. And I think that's absolutely crucial to responsible science. Um, so, well, four marks to the report. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, very much indeed. I mean, I suppose one might just uh, mention that after all, there's a, there's a very old Christian tradition, um, certainly medieval, if not before, of uh, imitatio Dei being uh, something which is positively Absolutely. good, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that actually we do things which uh, imitate God, we don't supplant him. Absolutely. I think Jews and Christians both have that tradition. Uh, Muslims have a variant on it. Uh, they believe in the notion of uh, human beings being khalif, which means that you're um, God's representative. An agent. Yeah, agent, yes. And I think all, all those notions of co-creation, of, of, of working responsibly, um, are all pretty important to me theologically as well. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, uh, Paul Freeman, um, who, um, is, uh, who holds the chair of protein crystallography at our university at Imperial, and he's co-director of the new uh, EPSRC centre. Uh, Paul. Thank, thank you, Robert. Um, Gosh, how do I follow <laughs> such a high level? <laughs> I'm just the poor, the jobbing scientist. But anyway, I, um, I, was, I had the actually privilege, I suppose, of taking part in this engagement. I'd never done this before, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what my experiences were. Um, I'm a professional scientist, have been one for the last 25 years. I've published about 130 uh, scientific referee papers, um, and I'd like to think I'm quite a good scientist. Um, but I've never actually been faced with the situation of being put in front of 16 people that I've never met before and actually having to describe uh, an area of research which is extremely complex. It's emerging, it's new, um, and, and put it into terms that at least that uh, these people could engage with. So the first point, I think, as a scientist entering into this whole thing is it's very, very challenging, and you really do need to think about making things accessible. And it's a brilliant exercise because I certainly learned a lot about how I explain my work to other people, um, and I think I found that very, very useful. The second point I learned was never, ever, ever underestimate, <laughs> which I haven't done, but some people do, the opinions of people who do not have the same expertise or profession as you. What I learned from this experience was that the um, opinions of these randomly selected people were incredibly enlightening. Um, and, you know, social scientists and people who do this sort of stuff will say, well, of course they are. But to me, as a scientist, I was really, um, um, you know, quite surprised, actually, by the quality of thoughts and thinking that came out of this um, debate. <clears throat> and it was very interesting to see people um, take on board the complexity of what you were trying to explain, but then actually reduce it into a situation and put their own interpretation on it in a way that was very meaningful um, and quite startling, um, particularly the point about, uh, gosh, creating life, that's better than destroying it. I mean, that was the quote of the week. Um, and, you know, I never expected that to come up. I expected a complete... Uh, um, people being very anti, very against, very anti-science, anti-technology, anti-everything. Um, and I think that was a really enlightening thing. And the, th the third point I'd like to make is um, it's very rewarding as a scientist to do this. And the reason it is rewarding, not only is it very interesting and challenging, um, people listen to you. It's extraordinary. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because I, 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 you know, I, I work in a university, uh, which is, you know, I would like to think one of the best universities in the country. 
uh, if I get someone to listen to me, <laughs> uh, agree with me, <coughs> uh, and, and both in my scientific <laughs> profession and in any other way, it, it's extraordinary. Uh, but to have a bunch of people actually listening to you, wanting to hear more uh, about you, and the, the unsatiable appetite for and thirst for knowledge um, is, is quite remarkable, actually. And I think that's something which I've really uh, underestimated before. Uh, that the public actually are, the public, I hate that term actually, but the people I met, um, are actually extraordinarily interested uh, in what you do and they really want to learn about it. And that to me suggests we need to do a lot more as scientists. And, and having said that, we do. I mean, I, I shouldn't say this is not a ground zero position. Scient we have a lot of scientific engagement and Lord Winston is a, a fantastic exponent at engaging and translating complex information out into the public domain. But we need to do a lot, lot more because it's an open door. People really, really want to know about this stuff um, in my field. And, and to me, I think that's brilliant. People listen to me. It's fantastic. So that's about it. Thank you, Paul. Well, it's open to you. Um, we've got uh, time for a bit of a debate. And um, I think it would be still helpful to remember to try and introduce yourselves and to use the microphone. Um, and I will tend to favour people who haven't answered before, asked a question before, but forgive me, that's not rudeness. It's just simply that I want to get as many people in as possible. Hi, I'm Perry Walker from the New Economics Foundation. We're about to do a small piece of work getting people talking about synthetic biology in Scotland. And because we all want people to do this at home or down the pub or whatever, we don't have scientists presenting. We have a, a kit which contains chunks of information about the topic. We produce kits on a dozen scientific topics and this has been much the hardest. And the challenge has been to find images, metaphors, analogies that really communicate what it's all about. And so we've had some examples today, but I wanted to ask the panel which <coughs> images, analogies, metaphors you think are the most powerful and the most profound. Thank you. That's a really interesting question. Um, who wants to kick off with that? Uh, uh, can I, Fiona, can I, can I ask you first? Please? I don't know the answer. Robin? <laughs> no, I allude to Paul. Paul. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a really difficult question to address. Um, and, you know, I can just say that the analogies that I find <clears throat> most illuminating, um, to be honest, was trying to describe, um, and this is not a very good description, perhaps, of living organisms, but, you know, parts, bits of things that you can assemble and put together and they work in a particular way because everyone seems to understand how to build things, or at least they understand the concept of putting things together to get something that they want to get. Um, mm. So, I mean, that's very simplistic, but that to me seemed to, that was a, they could grasp that more easily. Um, and, and of course we were doing that, we were trying to present synthetic biology in an engineering context, so that fitted very well. And people understand a lot about, I think a lot about engineering, you know, they, they know about how to build things. Leslie Patterson, grab a microphone and give us your view. Um, just to say, actually, Scotland were extraordinarily supportive, far more than any other region. London and the South East, actually, they were the most, most least supportive of it, but really significant results. But also to say, with images, we didn't actually use images, but it's also, I think it's difficult as well, because, like, say, like the images that Jane was using with biology and this sort of engineering cog, it's, it's that difficulty between how you let people frame it for themselves and... And yes, so I think it would be to use a variety and not just the sort of, and maybe something that exemplifies the sort of engineering and biology, as well as sort of bi and biology as engineering. But yeah, Scotland, really supportive. Don't know why. I don't know if they hear more about biotech and Dolly and, I don't know. Uh, Fiona, you want to come back um, on that, It's maybe? not an answer, but it's an observation that we need to crack this very quickly because um, you've made that comment about the, the difficulty of finding images and we also heard that when you Google synthetic biology, you don't get anything that's accessible. Um, and I think, again, one of the things with the HFE bill, you had like GIG, the genetics interest group, um, using an artist to do artist impressive, fantastic leaflets, which the journalists lapped up. Um, and one of the problems in that in the early days were there were no images and every article showed a picture of a fetus and we were like, this is a 14-day embryo, why are you showing a fetus in a womb? Well, they couldn't get the images. Well, maybe so like, somebody yeah. has to crack that. I don't know whose job it is, Orange, but to get this kind of um, stuff up pretty quickly. Robin. Yeah, I think there is a problem at the heart of this um, because um, a term has come which has been used widely in the States and hasn't been used here very much, but it's come with quite a lot of baggage. And it's come, unfortunately, with contradictory definitions. Uh, so sometimes it includes uh, genetic engineering, sometimes it includes nanotechnology, sometimes it doesn't. Um, 
I don't know how you get out of this one, but, um, and it's not for a theologian to tell you this, but, but uh, the, I, the bits that I found most helpful was the word synthetic, that is actually involves some, some combination of synthetic and biomaterials. But once you start making it too wide, it's, it's trouble if you can include too much, and it does get very confusing. Yeah. Um, following on from that, um, although it's heartening to hear the results from this public dialogue uh, exercise, I do often think it's worth mounting some kind of public defense or explanation of the very idea of synthesis and artifice and how they can benefit humanity, whether that's reclaiming playing God as a positive thing or what have you. We heard earlier about the, you know, the first time that an organic compound was made from inorganic components. And following that, to my understanding, the term organic, it, it was widely understood that that didn't equate to being alive, didn't equate to whether something was synthesized or natural. Nowadays, as far as I can tell, the word organic is some sort of soil association kite mark, meaning that your food is, is wholesomely natural, which to my mind is, is a step backwards. So uh, that kind of broad defense I do think is warranted. Engineers are the best place to do it. Social scientists and natural scientists should line up in defense next to them to do it. I'm going to ask Paul to answer that question. Um, if you don't mind, I won't get the whole panel because I'd like to get so as many what, questions as possible. I thought it was more of a comment. What was the specific question that you were? It's that despite the, the heartening nature of these public dialogue yeah. <coughs> results, yeah. there, there is a pre prevalent prejudice against synthesis and yeah. artifice, and there, and there is a misunderstanding of terms like organic and inorganic that plays into that prejudice you that, that deserves to be addressed and redressed. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, I mean, if we could redefine the names, if I, if, if I could do it again, I, synthetic is not great. Uh, it sends all sorts of images to people um, that, that, you know, and you know, it, this is, uh, you know, biological engineering would be uh, a perhaps a more uh, and that's essentially what we're trying to do. We're trying to develop engineering systems. It, it is very interesting, you know, many years ago when the magnetic resonance imaging machine was, uh, was first uh, launched, uh, of course there was an alternative name for it which involved the word radiation. Uh, and, um, which is also natural radiation, uh, of course, not, not widely known. But, you know, it's an interesting issue about badging. Um, yeah, there's a gentleman there who's got his hand up, if you would. Hi, uh, Oron Katz, I'm from the University of Western Australia. I run a laboratory where artists can work with biology called Symbiotica. Uh, so just to continue uh, in regard to the images and what type of uh, engagement, uh, and actually touching also on the whole notion of the biohacker, I think by stopping people from doing so, we would have less and less images. And if we allow artists to be more than just uh, dress, uh, shop, you know, shop front dressers uh, and allow them to engage hands on with what synthetic biology means to us as a society, as people, uh, in the most intimate and most uh, direct and experiential way, something, might, something good might uh, come out of it, but m might not be the thing that you're expecting. Yeah, um, no, I just agree with it. I think, I think um, using accessible images and bringing other people apart from scientists into the debate um, so that it's a wider cultural thing. One word of warning, uh, we have the most awesome, interminable, painful debate um, about whether to call them human-animal embryos, hybrids, cyborgs, admixed embryos. It went on and on and on. And actually, my thing all the time was, A, the journalists will carry on calling them human-animal embryos, whatever you guys decide in this 12-month email exchange. And B, they are a mixture of human and animal. And at your peril, lots of people wanted to say they're human embryos. It's a rabbit's egg. It's a cow's egg. And actually, putting that out of the picture and not making the argument to the public why using a cow's egg or an animal's egg is the right thing to do is not winning the argument. Can uh, I just, sorry, Robert, can I just, yes, of course. Then, can I just say that on that last question, there are colleagues here from the Royal College of Art. In fact, we've, we've actually been interacting with them. I think you're there. In fact, that's you, actually. Two of them side by side. Yeah, there. exactly. And yeah. I just wondered yeah. whether you, you know, that's, that's an area which I think you're beginning to explore in your final year uh, or one of your first year design course about images of synthetic biology is very I exciting. Haven't, so haven't persuaded anybody from the Royal College of Music to join in yet, but maybe we'll get there eventually. <laughs> uh, we synthesise music after all. <laughs> um, uh, Professor Cole, back. Uh, thanks, Robert. J just to pick up on your point. You're right. In the early days, it was called NMR, Nuclear Magnetic Resonance. And it sort of became the Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Project. And then it became And I think, I mean, there are many other examples. A place where radioactive waste uh, may in the future be deposited in a geological formation is always referred to as a dump, almost as though it's become dusty and such. 
And I think it would be extraordinary value. I've not seen this, but it may have been done. If we could have a study, and maybe Fiona, this is something for you to pick up on, on what we might call the semiology of scientific references. I mean, what, what is attached to the meaning of words, both in the, uh, uh, by professionals and by the public? Um, and this also uh, operates uh, across languages. I went to a fascinating talk at the Goethe Institute a few years back, where somebody explained that the German word for umwelt, for environment, umwelt, has got totally different connotations from the word that we use, a brilliant analysis. Um, as I say, I've never seen any work on the semiology of scientific terms. Correct me if some people here know more, more than I do, but I think it'd be enormously valuable if we could look into it. Thanks, David. Uh, there, is, uh, there, are, ask, there is actually a group of empirical knowledge that do that. In the, in the, group, in the history group, <coughs> they've been looking at semiology, in fact. Um, Robin, do you want to comment on that? How we use words? Uh, yes. Um, um, my, I'd, Slight reservation, because I'm, I'm worried about people who redefine terms um, uh, to make them sound better. Yeah. I want them to be... Um, Badging is a problem. Isn't yes, I mean, we've had a few examples of this, uh, <laughs> and um, um, I, I, I'm much more concerned that we're frank about the risks and, um, and explicit about them, and uh, have proper governance mechanisms um, um, in place. Hugh, uh, Hugh Whittle, if you... If Thank you. Uh, Hugh Whistle uh, from the Nuffield Council on, on Bioethics. It's really just following this one along a little bit, which um, I, I agree. I mean, two things that are being said. One is uh, a difficulty in understanding some terms, whether we talk about uh, synthesis or organic or engineering, <coughs> or in terms of how they're used within the science and how they, they might be understood publicly. Um, but nevertheless, you know, the public, as Paul has said, have a great capacity to, to, to understand but I think we need to just recognize this on the other side of it, which is about the ethics as well. That there is a good capacity for moral intuitions or moral reasoning, but sometimes it's not expressed in the ways that we talk about them within a more academic environment of bioethics. And so to get a, a proper dialogue, we have to start to understand a little bit better what is meant by playing God or creating life. And that there are actually some very valuable moral, moral intuitions that are taking place there, um, but somehow, we haven't quite discovered a uh, common language that hooks up between the science, the ethics, the other disciplines that are playing into it, and the way that the public discourse works, which does have a capacity to understand, and where there is a lot of shared uh, um, uh, understanding, which sometimes we don't quite discover it. Well, Robin, you, you, you commented on uh, life ex nihilo, didn't you, out of, mm. out of nothing. Yeah. Uh, do you want to expand on, on, on that? Because, uh, I mean, at the moment, we're only dealing with bacteria. But it might go beyond that. I mean, who knows? Yes, absolutely. And uh, and um, and if you have a very inclusive um, uh, definition of um, synthetic biology, um, then it does come into things like human cloning and so forth. So it depends how far do you want to take your definition. Um, and and I think there are. Once we deal with humans, I think. Um, then we should, our caution level, our, our precautionary principle should be raised very considerably. Um, I, I, I've been an opponent of um, even, even the notion of human reproductive cloning for a long time on, on the grounds that you shouldn't do things to people without their consent um, and which involve risks and um, for which you can see very few benefits. I mean, it, it so obviously shouldn't be done or shouldn't even be attempted. So, when we, and I think the same kind of debate is going on in the, um, in the ethics of human enhancement as well. Of course, human enhancement, I mean, uh, we all drink coffee. I'm in the business of cognitive enhancement in my university. That's, that's what I'm paid to do. Um, but the dead come limits when you start implanting things into people or giving them drugs and so forth, in which most of us have rightly, I think, qualms about responsibility, uh, especially to young people. Are you happy with that feeling you want? Yeah, I mean, I, I just think, you know, Paul said at the beginning that it was almost a, a total shock to his system to go out and meet 16 members of the public. They framed everything differently, they, they asked things differently, and as Hugh says, you know, it, whether it's the media or the public, it doesn't come in the language that we decide it comes in. We don't, we can't have any control over it. So I actually, uh, sadly, I think it would be a complete waste of time to sit and do a major piece of work, certainly in relation to the news media, about the language of this. I think what you have to do is prepare to answer every question in the way it's put, embrace the 
way it's put, be honest, be open. Time and time again, these scientists explained why they wanted to use human and animal embryos in 25 different ways. And in the end, they got their case across. And 60% of the British public say, on the whole, I understand what they're trying to do, why they're trying to do it. And I think we should say yes. And Parliament voted yes. And I don't think that was with anybody sitting down and saying, we must call them admixed embryos and this. And I just think that's too prescriptive and if we are opening ourselves up to the media and the public we we get down and dirty with the way they want to debate these things it, it follows on quite nicely actually um, Ainsley Newsom from the University of Bristol I, I want to pick up I mean I think this question of language is important even though we're saying we can call it whatever we like the message is clear I mean obviously what we're being told today is engage early engage often but from my initial conversations with scientists who, who work in this field they're slightly skeptical I mean I think it's fantastic that we've got people here who've had a very positive experience but that's not the same for all scientists and I think a particular challenge in this field is that we have a lot of different definitions the boundaries of the field remain uncertain and we don't know exactly where it's going to lead and so there are some people who perhaps may be slightly more skeptical saying something like well shouldn't should we hold off on a detailed engagement until we know a bit more ourselves about what we're doing or should we actually just grab it and be honest about the fact that we don't quite know where it will lead? And so I just wanted to get the panel's responses, mainly so I can go back to the scientists I work with and perhaps try and encourage them to get involved a bit more. I can certainly answer that. I mean, there are a lot of scientists who, um, who are essentially cynical <laughs> because the profession of science is critique, and it's often self-critique, and it's critique of other people. That's what peer review is about. That's what makes science what it is. So inherently, you're talking about a lot of critical people uh, and you know, trying to get those critical and very uh, sometimes cynical people about, you know, about uh, and engaging in a, an area which we don't really know what is, is difficult. I think but they're I think also you, concerned think, about scaring people off well, no, too I early disagree. as well. Well, no, I absolutely disagree with that. I think you know, we're, we're doing this because we want to engage. We want it's, I mean, the whole field is very unusual. And, and I don't know whether it happens in other fields, but in synthetic biology particularly, there is this desire for the community to interact with social science. I mean, it's, we want to do this very much bottom-up from day one. I, I've never come across it in any other scientific field. Well, I think there's a sea change right across science, actually, to be fair. Right, fair enough. I think there really is a change, yeah, fair enough. and I think we will be benefiting from it. Yeah. Uh, Dick, you want to just yeah, chip in? I just want to pick up on that, that point. I mean, uh, nobody asked us to produce this report. No. Um, you know, I mean, the working party got together more or less spontaneously, you know, we persuaded the Royal Academy of Engineering that we didn't take much persuading, it was, it was an important area, and hundreds of hours of work have gone into it. And the reason for all of that is because, uh, you know, we and our colleagues actually want to bring this to your attention. Exactly. Hi, uh, Claire Ainsworth. I'm, I'm here with two hats on. I'm a science journalist, but I also run a company that trains scientists in science communication. Uh, and I was interested to hear your thoughts on where you see the regulation of synthetic biology going in this country and what the public involvement in that regulation would be. I mean, just um, picking up what, what Fiona said about um, the human-animal hybrid embryos, I thought it was um, uh, very interesting about the, the, the contribution that organisations like the HFEA have made to public acceptance of these sorts of things. They've done some very successful public consultations. So I was wondering whether you saw something like that in the future of synthetic biology. Robin, I'm going to ask you, because you have to raise the issue of regulation. <coughs> I'm, 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 I'm so negative about regulation, I won't, I won't join in this debate. Um, Robin. I, I actually don't agree with you about the hybrid embryos. Um, um, I think it was rather sprung on the public, and I think there's probably quite a bit of mistrust about that. I'm not even sure the ethical arguments were put properly. Um, I, it, I think they were in, in Parliament, and I think on the select committees, and I took part in them, I thought they were well put and well argued, but I don't think that actually was, was what got out further. I mean, it seems to me on, the, uh, on, on that very specific issue, um, the conservative religious groups um, <coughs> who object to, to embryo research, I thought on ethical grounds should have welcomed hybrid uh, research. Um, it, it doesn't involve the same questions. Uh, the, the, the hybrid is, is not a potential human being. Does anybody it, want to it, address, um, address it, the generality of regulation? And not, sorry. Just, not just with the oh, right. narrow, not narrow, the narrowness of embryology, but in general. Well, I think we have several, we have several different kinds of regulation. Um, 
uh, in this country we have the HFA, which is a statutory body which has powers. We have self-regulating bodies like the Stem Cell Bank Steering Committee, on which I've sat for many years, um, which is self-regulating in the sense that uh, it, it has certain powers, in, 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 but, but uh, it, because it's attached to the MRC and to funding. Um, but uh, I think we have a variety of patents in this country and quite a good uh, history of careful governance, regulation and issues which me, concern the public. Let me just challenge you on that briefly, just to make this debate more interesting. If you take the Soviet Union under Stalin, there was a clear abuse of science. There was a clear abuse of science still going on in China. Yeah. There was a clear abuse of science in the United States of America with the use of genetics in an innocent population being sterilized without consent. Yeah. There's been a clear abuse of science in this country by government on occasions with weapons technology and other technologies that actually the public would not have signed up to. Well, Porton Down, um, yes. Well, Porton Down is not an unreasonable example, but there are others as well. I hope it would be repeated now. It's interesting now. that the nuclear scientists, after all, were horrified when Jolly O'Curry published details of um, the chain reaction because it meant that actually it was now open to the Germans and actually a government would have wanted to keep that secret as the Manhattan Project does. Do we have complete trust in governments? And isn't that one of the issues for scientists? Um, well, I don't think these regulatory bodies are simply, uh, are simply government. I mean, the Stem Cell Ste Bank Steering Committee is, is, is not, manifestly not. So, I mean, I, I, th I think we have a, an understanding um, and journalists are very helpful in this because if, 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 if we try to get away with this in professions, you will certainly expose us. I mean, there's no question of that. Uh, it, it, and, uh, from the lab. I, I, I think Robin's answer is extremely helpful because actually what you're effectively saying is that the scientists might be better at regulating in, in a sense. But with public scrutiny. With public scrutiny. Yeah. Um, Paul. Just, just a very quick sort of thing from the, be from the bench. I mean, we, we are quite regulated, just to, as you probably know, and there, there is the genetic modification regulations in this country, which are quite rigorous, and our university applies them incredibly rigorous, rigorously. The Health and Safety Executive Committee that considers genetic modification have already looked at synthetic biology, and I'll, I'll have that on their brief already, and they're looking to see what... So, I mean, what we should probably do is identify what the risks are first, and then address how those can be regulated and there are a number of risks one obvious one is the escape of organisms but we've had that already that exists now second obvious uh, risk is emergent properties and behavior that we don't know may not do that's very difficult to regulate against that's something but again containment and all the rest of it um, and those are the major risks at the moment you know and it seems to me that we can deal with those under existing regulation but i you know you're being very specific. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. deliberately concentrating Sorry. on regulation with all three of our speakers because I think essentially this is going to be a very important area to continue a debate on. Fiona, can I, I mean, bring it's, you it, It's outside of my pay grade, this. I don't know anything about it, but I, I do know that the government sometimes responds to public fears by regulations rather than addressing public fears. Um, oh. So every plant scientist I've ever spoken to hates the GM regulations and points out that it shines this huge, great spotlight on one new technology in agriculture, but not on any others. Why? Because there was a debate about it, people were fearful. I think Robert Winston, if he's not going to say it himself, has got a very good point about the HFEA regulate routine IVF treatment, which millions of people have all over the place, an additional layer of regulation over the GMC and all, you know, heart operations or whatever. Um, similarly with animal research, you know, we are the most regulated country. That's great in an interview to say, you know, if animal research goes overseas, it'll be less regulated. But all the scientists I speak to say it is ridiculous. We are, it is holding back medical research. No it's actually question. holding back no, no implementing more humane ways of doing animal research. So all I can say is the scientists I speak to mm. are are not lovers of regulation and when you when you say to them why did it happen they say it was the government's answer to public worry well the way to answer government's uh, uh, public worry is to address it debate it make the arguments or win or lose not slap on regulation which damages research uh, Morris Lex from the European Commission um, I wanted to ask the panel if they do think that government regulation is necessary would it be better to have it at the international level, either at the level of, of Brussels or even internationally, <laughs> to I ensure that there is a level playing field for scientists all, all over the world? Morris, thank you. I think that may have to be our last question. Um, I'm sorry, Philip, um, but, I, but I want to wrap this up in, in reasonable time. 
Um, can I start with you, Robin? Is that reasonable? Yes, I mean, I think this is already happening. I mean, the, the, um, uh, my own experience is on the Stem Cell Bank Steering Committee. Uh, the NI, NIH and, uh, is, in, is in a consultation at the very moment, and it's undoubtedly consulting with exactly that body. So, I mean, the international um, knowledge, I think, is important. Yes, it's very difficult to enforce things internationally. I mean, uh, Robert earlier on um, mentioned China, and I think um, the, the, the clear loopholes in, uh, there in terms of uh, regulation. Um, yeah, self-governance. I'm all for it as long as it's as long as it's rigorous, as long as it's robust, um, and as long as it's carefully inspected and transparent. I mean, all those things seem to me to be absolutely vital. I think, uh, I think uh, Europe, a European perspective is absolutely essential. I think it's already happening, actually, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, but I think w what one needs to try and really recognize is what are we regulating? Um, and it's, it's great saying we need regulations and we need this, but we've got to actually try and have a debate about what, what we're hoping to regulate against. Um, and the thing about synthetic biology, which came across <coughs> this engagement, is people are quite worried about the open source nature of all of this information. So I think that needs to go into the debate about how do you regulate an open source science. Yeah. Um, we just ran a briefing on the EU Clinical Trials Directive, which is apparently a complete disaster. So, and the message was that scientists didn't engage in the directive as it was being drawn up. It was EU ministers with the pharmaceutical industry, not the actual clinical trial scientists. So I think the answer is, as you're saying, that, that engineers and scientists should be right in there in you know, influencing these regulations and have something that's fit Absolutely. for purpose. Absolutely. I'm, I'm really grateful to the three of you, and I'm really grateful to the other speakers, and also, of course, to the Royal Academy of Engineering. I think this is a very interesting heel in the water episode, really, in what's going to be a, a continuing debate, which I'm sure will increase. Very grateful for all of you to come, and it's my pleasure to call on Philip to come and close the meeting for us. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, ends this morning's uh, discussion. I think we have had a most interesting, uh, a most informative, and I think a most important uh, debate this morning. It's very clear to me, and I'm sure to everyone else here, that this is just the start. Uh, it's very, very early in the science and in the engineering uh, and it's very early in the, in the process of public engagement, but I don't think any of us, having heard what we've heard this morning, can doubt that this is a critically uh, important process uh, if this uh, science and this engineering is going to proceed uh, in an orderly fashion in the way that, uh, that I think we would, we would all wish. Uh, and we've heard from some very eminent uh, people today, so I think if I could now ask uh, you all to thank all our speakers and our panellists. Thank you.